so much for that wonderful introduction, Steve. Um, I'll share my screen because um, I do have some photos for you. Um, can everybody see that? Um, is that all right, Steve? Perfect. Great. Um, so thank you all for joining. I hope you enjoy uh, my talk today. Um, this is based on my PhD research. Um, so any comments or questions will be gratefully received at the end. Um, and I'll start now. So um, this paper today will explore the relationship between two members of Downside Abbey who were part of the monastic community in the late 19th century and whose influence can be seen in the very fabric of the Abbey Church today. These two men were also part of a domestic dispute that occurred between 1880 and 1900, known as the Downside Controversy, which advocated for a return to a more retrospective, more medieval structure of monasticism. The Abbey is representative of this vision of neo-monastic reform that was established by these two men. Through this, the representation of the me medieval past was intrinsic to the Downside community and is, and is reflected in the architecture of the monastery they built in Somerset in the 19th century. I shall briefly sketch out the context of the controversy, then take you on a brief tour of the Abbey's architecture and take you through the aspects of the Abbey Church that relate to the two men I intend to introduce you, to you today. Oh. Hang on, sorry, I'm just having... There we go. So the period of reform I refer to occurred between 1880 and 1900 and involved all, nearly all the communities that made up the English Benedictine congregation at that time. This period of reform was known amongst the community as the downside controversy. And as I said, advocated for a return to a more retrospective, more medieval structure of monasticism. The controversy involved various members of the English Benedictine congregation and was typified by a series of battles between the younger and the elder generations of the community. The movement, which was the younger monks, as they were known, consisted of lots of the younger monks at Downside who wanted to return to a more monastery-centred and medieval approach to their vocation. The senior community wanted to continue with a missionary-centred vocation that had been the tradition of the 300 years since their inception at Dowie in 1606. The events of the controversy confirmed the progressive mo movement of the idea, the ideas of the movement, and eventually raised downside to a minor basilica and gave monasteries that control over their own properties, monks and missions. The justification for reform, or indeed upholding the status quo, was often terms in an appeal to history, and downside sense of its own historic identity served as the impetus behind many aspects of the controversy. This historic identity was multifaceted and fluid with an emphasis on continuity, community and collective memory. This sense of collective memory within the context of the foundational structure that the monks wanted to exhibit worked to create cohesion with an emphasis on establishing foundational stability and helping the community develop a connection to a wider and more stable Christian narrative. And this is where the um, monastery comes in. Every aspect of um, the church, the Abbey Church, um, relates back to this idea of um, the shared history. For example, um, the community um, did this on a um, quite a literal level by invoking a history beyond their foundational date of 1606 to address the wounds caused by the Reformation and just as a justification for the strength, their new strength within the EBC. Do you base open in Mozart create a this sense of historic identity was reflected in the actions of the monks and the growing confidence of the community throughout this period, in which the constitutional crisis resulted in what was considered by members and non-members alike as the greatest change since Plantata and demonstrated the reactionary nature of this new wave of modern monasticism. The downside controversy was a result of this drive towards a, a new wave of modern monasticism and a development of the complete monastic vision, which can be seen here in the Abbey Church. Um, and we'll just take you inside. So the monastic landscape at Downside consists of the monastery, the abbey church and school buildings, which were all built incrementally over time as the community and school grew. English Catholicism experienced a renaissance during the 19th century. This shift in fortune since the expulsion of the monasteries during the Reformation 
was also reflected in the activities of the monastic communities that resettled in England during this period. The monasteries such as Downside Abbey saw increasing numbers of novices, the expansion of their authority, and they sought to build what the community saw as the greatest influence in inspiring and developing monastic ideas, which were the then new monastic buildings. In building both a spiritual and physical home in Somerset, the monks used the neo-Gothic structure to reflect the modern concerns of English Catholics. This was the impact of an increasingly confident Catholic community on the religious landscape of the 19th century and reflected the changing religious, political and social concerns of the community. For those of you who have not visited Downside, and if you haven't, I really recommend that you do, let me give you a brief introduction to its architecture. The Abbey Church of St Gregory the Great is marked by its unfinished West End, neo-Gothic construction, and what Sir Nicholas Pensfer in 1973 would go on to describe as the most splendid demonstration of the Renaissance of Roman Catholicism in England. The foundation stone for the Abbey Church was laid in a grand ceremony on the 1st of October 1873. The church was built in a Gothic revival style by a succession of architects, Dun and Hansom between 1872 and 1890, Compter 99 to 1900, Garner 1901 to 1905, Waters 11 to 12, and Gilbert Scott from 1923 to 25. And after the events of the downside controversy, the Abbey was raised to a minor basilica in 1900. The tower was completed in 1938, housing the bell named the Great Breed, which was a memorial to Cardinal Roger Vaughan of Sydney and remains the second highest tower in Somerset. The Abbey was finally consecrated in 1935. The Abbey is finished in Bath um, and Delting Stone with a tile and copper sheeting roof. The East End, Ambulatory and Lady Chapel were completed by Dunn and Handsome in French Perpendicular. Much of the interior was rib vaulted in the 13th, French, 13th century French style, and many of the carvings, tombs, paintings, stained glass, tombs and recesses are by Sir Nina Compter, as well as the Lady Chapel. The nave with its blind aisles, perpendicular arcades and triforium in the decorated style, and South Gallery chapels over a North Clo Cloister is by Gilbert Scott, which is con uh, connected to the temporary West End in a simplified perpendicular style. The transepts with chapels and the base of the tower are, eight, are dated 1882 and by Dun and Hansom in a rich early English style. And the chancel is, was completed between 1901 and 1905 by Garner in early perpendicular style. The tower was finished in um, 1938 by Gilbert Scott, Scott in what's known as Somerset perpendicular. And then if I may, I will now take you through the Abbey Church and introduce you to these two men who left, they, who left their mark on the building in its community. So as you arrive at Downside, you can enter um, through the church's tower, um, to the church's tower through this doorway, which I invite you here to take a closer look at. Um, I'm looking in particular at these two men that are on either, either side of the door. And I'll just take you into a close up now. There you go. Um, and can you see these two men, um, these two stone carvings of the men that frame the doorway? On the left is Cardinal uh, Francis Aidan Gasquet, and on the right is Abbot Edmund Hugh Ford. These two men were instrumental in the making of modern downside. And here's a picture of them in real life um, in their later years. I think this is taken in Italy. Um, so Cardinal Gasquet, so, who is on the left, and you've got... Um, Ford on the right. So Gasquet was born in 1847 in London and eventually rose to become the Prior of Downside, a Cardinal and Vatican Librarian. In his lifetime, he was notable as a historian and for his work on the Vulgate. Abbot Ford was twice elected as Prior and Abbot of Downside and became titular Abbot of Glastonbury. Ford and Gasquet were influential figures in both the controversy and the construction of the Abbey Church, and it is their shared vision that is represented throughout the building. And this is reflected in the community's connection to the medieval and the desire to rec recreate this medieval past and the architecture and symbolism of the Abbey Church. They met as schoolfellows at Downside and followed each other into the church, completing their novitiate at Belmont before returning to Downside to continue their monastic careers. As noted in Bruno Hicks's biography of Ford, it appeared that the most significant factor 
and the school life of Hugh Ford was the friendship he made with Francis Gasquet, who came to the school in um, 1862 and was some four years his senior. And this is really notable in the archive material that's um, preserved at Downside. There's really wonderful letters between them um, and the correspondence that lasted from um, the moment they arrived at Downside to the moment they left. And so before we move further into the building, amongst the Downside collections are sets of regular correspondence occurring between Ford and Gasquet from their novitiate to, through to old age. And so here I want to show you a letter from May um, 1874 from Gasquet to Ford, which describes the early building stages of the church. Here it is. So Gasquet writes, and I've sort of marked it out with the lines on the screen. Um, Gasquet's writing is not so bad. Um, out of all the people in the archive, so maybe you can read it. But it says, the building is getting along famously. I wish you could get a glimpse of it now and then. It has really exceeded the monasteries in the air we had any of us built. The idea in the drawing falls very short of the reality, unlike what it usually does. Most certainly, if we are not good in that place, it will not be from want of a beautiful place. And this letter marks a really important moment in the two monks' lives. It demonstrates how the progression of the monastery impacted their developing monastic careers. It also shows how this idea of the development of a complete monastic vision and a reform were influenced by the ambition, ambitious building plans they developed. This collaborative effort in shaping their monastic futures continued throughout their lives and helped shape their approach to their own monastic identities, as well as the building itself. In developing the reform movement, the young monastic community led by Ford and helped by Gasquet sought to match the grandeur of the rising stonework and develop the monastic community beyond its walls. Now, at this point, when this letter is written, um, both men are novices in the monastery. Um, Ford was actually in Australia and Gasquet was back at Downside. Um, Ford, who had always been of um, fragile health, struggled under the austere conditions at Belmont where their novitiate occurred, and on fear for his continued strength, took his vows early and was sent with Archbishop Vaughan to help establish the Australian church while simultaneously recovering his health with a mixture of good weather and robust work. Back at Downside, Gasquet was left to continue to support the building of the new monastery, and whose letters, this, whose letters during this period present an interesting mix of current downside affairs, local gossips and updates on the building work on which they were so invested and would shape the vast majority of their later lives. Um, the relationship with the Australian mission in particular was very pertinent for Ford. The community building that occurred there was greatly influential on the monastic vision the two monks sought to achieve. And this can be seen um, as being rooted in their relationship from um, young men. As before Gasquet left for the novitiate at St. Michael's Priory in Belmont, they would get up early before the other boys and go quietly down to one of the classrooms to discuss their plans for the future. I think this is a really lovely idea of them scurrying away and uh, going and talking about the, um, the monastery that they would then build and the monastic vision that they would create. And this also perhaps demonstrates their shared virtue as their plans for the future resulted in the progression of the house through um, su successive abatial um, leaderships and acted as the driving force um, behind Downside's successful revision to a minor basilica. As the historian Sarah Cole suggests, one proposition that recurs in many texts and not only literary texts, um, and such as letters such as this, is that friendship might function as the bridging structures between individuals and institution. Um, in their letters, there's a distinct emotional architecture that is apparent within the relationship between the two monks here and how the institution covers um, this relationship. And it's especially uh, true in these early letters between Ford and Gasquet, where the institutional framework is so clearly defined in the construction of the Abbey Church and is referenced continually throughout their letter writing. Um, most of the letters that Gasquet sends always carry um, a few lines about what's happening um, in, the, in the Abbey and how the building work is going. Um, there's even um, sometimes little drawings of what the new, um, the new uh, buildings look like, although I would say I don't think Gasquet was much of an artist. Um, for example, um, there's a letter from the same period which Gasquet signs off with. Um, Goodbye, my dearest brother, and mind you come home strong and ready to give alma mater a help up the hills, your affectionate brother, F.A. Gasquet. 
And this clearly demonstrates how both uh, men's lives are shaped by these institutional frameworks, having lived under monastic rule from childhood, intertwining brotherhood and friendship with a sense of duty to one's house, and also indicates the depth of feeling these monks had towards their home and how, um, how committed they were to um, improving the conditions that, of downside. So this picture now is one of my favourites. Um, this is, I think, I believe the Lady Chapel, um, and that's actually Ford um, in amongst the building work, which I think is really lovely. Um, and these early ambitions can be seen in the context of the building work that had already occurred while they were schoolboys. The new building was seen, um, and this is a quote by Cuthbert Butler, who was also instrumental in the down, um, downside controversy and was a very good friend to both of them, um, as well as a great abbot of downside. A great influence in inspiring and developing monastic ideas at Downside must be attributed to the then new buildings. We, the community, felt that we had to live up to them. And this manifesto of progression was emphasized by the rapid progression of building at Downside that occurred since the placing of the foundation stone. And so um, the start of the building work was undertaken by Prior Murphy and Prior Murphy, um, quote, Determined that the church should not be relegated to a dim future, but should be part of the actual immediate building scheme and should be no college chapel, but a real monastic church on the scale and after the manner of an abbey church of old. And I think if you look at Downside, I think, I think they really did achieve that. And so here's some of the early architectural plans. And so um, Abbot Murphy, Prior Murphy, sorry, um, push to create the church culminated in the building plans of Dun and Hanson, which should be worthy of the traditions associated with the Benedictine name. This confidence reflected in the building work that took place at Downside, where the building acted as tribute to the confidence the community possessed. Quote, the monks found themselves dwelling in a monastery and erecting a church, which as far as material buildings went, placed Downside in the ranks of the greater Benedictine monasteries of old, end quote. This was continued under Ford and Gasquet, where the work continued by Giles Gilbert Scott in the reproduction Gothic scale, where the Middle Ages architecture gave the sentiment of a larger and freer existence, the grand monastery embodied in an ideal and inspired us. That's another quote from um, Butler, which I think really gives a flavour of what they were trying to achieve. The ambitious nature of Ford and Gasquet can also be seen in the influence they had over the decorative elements of the Abbey. Um, not only do the two men appear above the doorway, but also in symbolic gestures around the Abbey Church. So on the left, we have um, St. Francis of Assisi, and this is actually on the corner of Gasquet's tomb. Um, it's found at the foot of Gasquet's term, uh, tomb and the Abbey Church, and on the right, St. Hugh of Lincoln and his swan. So aside from being important saints, they also share family names with Ford and Gasquet. Um, uh, obviously Francis Gasquet and Hugh Ford and so it can be seen as a nod to the former members of the community. Um, there are also if you ever go round uh, many heraldic symbols around the church which also symbolise the Gasquet family who gave many donations to the community to support the building work and several windows in the upstairs chapel are dedicated to the Gasquet family who paid for the work to be completed. In the choir the cockwell motif for the Gasquet family appears on several occasions. And likewise, the Ford family also gave money to the Abbey and small plaques can be seen around the Abbey church relating to them. However, Ford's legacy is more so in the finer details of the Abbey. It's him who presided over many of the decorative aspects of the Abbey church. For example, the north wall windows um, design was insisted upon for Ford and the three lancets that are in there um, are inspired by St Albans. As we move through the Abbey Church, we see more influences from various medieval cathedrals of England that inspired the return to a more monastery centred vocation, such as Chester, Exeter, and most importantly to Ford and Gasquet, Glastonbury. Um, Ford obviously became titular abbot of Glastonbury and actually um, organised a pilgrimage um, to Glastonbury during his time as prior, um, and Gasquet wrote extensively on um, the medieval Glastonbury. Um, during his career as a, as a historian. And this relationship with the past was also firmly embedded within the architecture of the Abbey Church. The monks of Downsize consciously built this revival of medieval monasticism into the physical body of the church. And it is reflected, for example, in the altar stone of the Abbey Church. 
The altar contained stone taken from the ruins at Glastonbury Abbey, which, can, which was seen by the community as a potent symbol of England's monastic heritage. The Glastonbury stone even retains on the inside evidence of the original window mouldings or door jams, which have been untouched in its new position. Indeed, the significance of Glastonbury stone for the community is linked to the uh, revival in Gothic architecture, which is visible throughout the whole of the monastery, as well as within English religious architecture and culture more widely at the time. Furthermore, the uh, altar decoration also contains link to, links to Glastonbury, with six candlesticks and a crucifix made of bog oak from the area. The community at Downside were deeply interested in the relationship with, the, with Glastonbury Abbey and was the source of much scholarship within the movement during this period. Gasquet, as I um, said, wrote extensively on Glastonbury and in 1908 wrote um, a book called The Last Abbot of Glastonbury and His Companions, a historical sketch, in which he declared, I quote, the history of Glastonbury is the history of its abbey. Without its abbey, Glastonbury would, was nothing, which is an interesting insight into the thoughts of one of the main forces behind the Abbey Church and the reform movement within the community and connects the building and its relationship to the past with conviction. And sort of also, um, I think, really links the idea that the community and the church are intrinsically bound and that um, to have a grand community, you need a grand abbey, which I think they definitely achieved. Furthermore, a few lines later, Gasquet takes the motif between history and the physicality of space to be here and here alone. We are linked not only to the beginnings of English Christianity, but to the beginnings of Christianity itself. There was also great physical interest in Glastonbury, which is marked by the pilgrimage I mentioned earlier by Ford during his time as abbot, and the excavation work done by, Ethel, by fellow monk Ethelbert Horn, um, who was joint director of the excavations at Glastonbury Abbey in 1928. Um, and here is a quote from Gasquet's memoirs, which suggests a highly romantic attachment to the idea of Glastonbury. It was more than the ghost of Glastonbury. It was one of the great abbeys re-risen from the pages of his first book as though Glastonbury was restored, rebuilt for England. It also forms part of the community's feelings as part of a clear connection to the idea of construction of Downside being part of the restoration of the monasteries. The community were inspired by the grandeur of early monasteries and wanted to evoke the same sense of a historic context within their construction work. Glastonbury and its mythical position and its connection to Arthurian legend and holy status would have, would have appealed to the members of the movement who wanted to develop a sense of authority and permanence in the Somerset countryside. Furthermore, the Abbey Church and Ford and Gasquet themselves was consistently inspired by the ancient cathedrals and comprises of features that take direct inspiration from the major medieval um, cathedrals in the country. These two aspects were heavily petitioned by Ford, who was also the main instigator by, behind the employment of Garner as the architect, which surprisingly now who had not been a popular vote amongst the community. Um, the building of the choir can be seen as one of the most significant aspects of the project to create the Abbey Church, and it was spearheaded first by Gasquet and then by Ford during their times as prior and abbot, respectively. Um, it would also become a highly symbolic part of the church in the post-war period when Abbot Leander Ramsey dedicated the memories of the boys lost in the Great War. Um, but on the other hand, the building of the choir appears to be in a really difficult process from the offset. And as Butler wrote in the 1931 Downside Review, um, we owe it to him, to Ford, not only the choir, but the fact that it is Garner's choir. For strange as it appears now, at the time there was great opposition, and it required all the abbot's firmness and tact to satisfy the community that Garner should be trusted. Um, there was also... Um, a connection to Westminster and they wanted it to replicate that and Garner had great difficulty in replicating uh, Westminster for the modern monastic requirements and the needs of um, a community, a growing community. And this is typified in difficulty in replacing Westminster's medieval altar, um, which had no need for a benediction throne, so it had to be modified quite significantly um, to fit in here at Downside. Ultimately, the contribution of Garner was so important to the community that Garner and his wife were buried in the Abbey in a vault between, beneath the choir that he had designed. Um, this relationship between architect and memorialization was a reoccurring theme within the Abbey Church. For example, in the event of the death of Leonard Stokes, Leander um, Ramsey suggested that the school buildings at Downside are more deeply impressed with the spirit of Leonard Stokes than any of his other works and therefore his best memorial. Um, 
you can see here the choir stores and the garner design woodwork of the choir was modeled on the stores at Chester Cathedral and contains amongst the depiction of the Psalms images such as the cockerel motif of Gasquet. And Gasquet's sermon for the opening of the choir reminded the community that it had been 300 years since St. Gregory's had been founded in Dowie and placed great stress on this Westminster connection for, I quote, it is the glory and boast that has never been with us any breach of continuity with the Catholic England. And so they take this um, trail of, um, I guess, downside monasticism through Westminster through to downside today. And this was in clear reference to the activity of the movement and a reflection on the new monastic spirit that was developing under the reforms of the controversy, which would be continued under Ford as abbot. However, the emphasis on individual achievement can be seen most clearly in the presence of um, Edmund Ford and Gasquet in the building itself. They left their mark throughout the church buildings during their times as superiors of the monastery and as key members of the movement. And this can be seen symbolically in those carvings I showed you earlier of Ford and Gasquet above the door, which demonstrates their confidence they found in their uh, positions in the community. And these small touches add to the sense of importance that these two men had upon the building and is commemorated by the community in the presence of their memorials in the transept. Gasquet also um, appears in the nave where a scheme by Gilbert Dolan was to represent all the saints celebrated in the Benedictine calendar on the arches. However, this scheme was abandoned and instead um, the heads of the significant figures in the community appear, Gasquet, Dolan and Thomas James. And these, all, these figures were all involved in the building of the abbey at that time with Thomas um, James being the clerk of works during this period. So Ford died in 1925 and is buried in the North Transept. In the story of Downside Abbey, which was written by fellow monk Augustine James, um, who proclaimed Ford as being considered the best man for the job after the constitutional qu questions were settled and the community needed their first abbot. Likewise, um, Butler, in his obituary of Ford, wrote, Abbot Ford was laid to rest fittingly in his own choir of the Abbey Church near his lifelong friend, Cardinal Gasquet. No man, of course, could do such work alone and other names stand out as cooperating, Cardinal Gasquet and Car Abbot Ramsey. But th as things appear to me, looking back on the last 50 years, Abbot Ford, more than any man, can claim the, make, the title maker of modern downside. This communal effort refers to the period after Gasquet's resignation as prior when Ford was left to continue the building work. So Ford was, uh, Gasquet resigned as um, prior due to ill health and retire, um, retired to London where he actually started a lot of his historical works. But Ford was left with two major projects in, form, in the form of the Lady Chapel and the remaining parts of the tower. And indeed Ramsey's importance to the School of Downside um, cannot be underestimated. He really transformed the school, but it's only through um, his appointment by, by Ford that allowed him to do that. So they're all uh, very much intertwined. And it, um, it remains here to add the detail that it was Ford that appointed him and gave him the freedom to reform the school. His memory at Downside um, has been described by Wolfson Philipson, which is another monk below, um, in, um, as being very impactful on the community. The name of Hugh Edmund Ford will never be a memory to Downside School for a memory is of the dead. It is a presence, a living and spiritual thing and a heart that is worthy of it that can never die. So in this picture here um, on the right is Ford's tomb, which was designed by um, Giles Gilbert Scott, and it was carved in Cheltenham and so shows um, Ford in full pontifical robes with three small monk figures on the front of the tomb mourning him. However, um, Augustine James in the story of Downside Abbey proclaims that the effigy of Ford very, bears very little likeness. And yet the records show um, in the archives that there was very much um, a lot of back and forth between Garner and the community uh, regarding Ford's likeness. It was sent um, back several times uh, because the rest of the community didn't like what was pe being produced. Now, I would say I don't think it particularly looks like Ford um, or certainly not like any of the pictures I've seen of him. So heaven knows what the, um, the original ones look like and the ones they rejected, but this is, this is the one they ended up with anyway. And on the left of your screen is a, a small section of Gasquet's tomb. And um, 
Likewise, the death of Cardinal Gasca on the 5th of April um, 1929 in Rome was a momentous and solemn occasion for both the community and the wider Catholic society. His body was laid in state in Rome and after three days, the body was sealed and carried back um, to the Church of Santa Maria where um, Gasco's funeral was, um, re, um, was sung by Abbot, the Abbot of Monte Cassino and the absolutions were given by the Dean of the Sacred College. After the ceremonial in Rome being completed, Gasco's body was returned to England and buried at Downside. Um, Gasco's tomb, as you can see, uh, was finished in grey marble with the head of its intended, supported by an angel and by and the feet by a figure from history. And it stands close to the chapel of St. Benedict on the south side of the choir. Um, Scott himself regarded the tomb of Gasco to be one of his finest pieces of work. Um, it is interesting to note the juxtaposition between the tra traditional medieval form of the tomb and the neo-Gothic um, interpretation that Scott gave the piece. Um, the figure of history, I, I always think, is of Bede, who sits at his feet, um, as well as the obvious scholarly connection to Bede, who is act actively venerated at Glastonbury. And the abbey possessed a set of relics um, allegedly belonging to Bede, which was presented by a royal donor in the 10th century. And Bede appears at many points in the Abbey, including on the altar frontal in the chapel of St. Oliver Plunkett in the north transept and painted onto the redos um, in St. Placid's chapel. Now, this is a wonderful picture that um, Francis, who worked with us a while ago, did, but it's one of my favourites because you can really see how the Abbey transformed. So this is them building it. And obviously um, the image behind is what is what is now there. But um, this was quite an arduous process and quite hard work. Um, until Downside was transformed into an abbey after the events of the controversy, all proposals had to be approved by the general chapter of the English Benedictine congregation. So the monks weren't able to make um, decisions themselves. It had to be taken to the general chapter, which um, involved all the um, abbots and priors of all the other communities. Um, and so decisions had to go there, um, which, um, obviously changed once um, Downside became a, a abbey and um, got its own abbot and was able to make decisions itself. But um, unfortunately, the issues of financing the building work would not be um, would be too late to be resolved by the eventual changes to the EBC. And as such, there are many examples of benefactors and funding within the Abbey Church. Even from the beginning, finances constrained the ambition of the community. Um, in fact, in 1846, all projects were brought to a halt due to financial issues, leading to Hansom's designs for the community to be greatly delayed and reduced in size by the time it was approved um, by the general chapter. And in fact, um, in the archives, we have um, what seems like hundreds of plans of the Abbey that didn't happen. I mean, the Pugin plans are a prime example of, of, of the ambition of the community that just didn't get realised and were unable to um, go ahead, mainly because they would have been so expensive. Um, and Gasquet were, and Ford were particularly involved in the search for methods of funding their ambitious project. Um, as evidence in this letter from uh, Gasquet to um, an unknown reader, but um, it says, I have written to the president for leave to build the cloister and on permission um, coming, I shall attack Dr. Bennett, who has shown no signs of being generous as yet. Madame de Perea and a sister of each promised a chapel, um, which I think is quite an interesting way to describe people that you're trying to trying to get money off. Um, and fe um, he had, there's definitely um, several letters where he, he takes this quite aggressive and amusing approach to um, getting money for the church. But I mean, these people did, and it certainly works. As well as directly targeting those who had the funds to help build the Abbey, Ford founded the St. Gregory's Society in 1880, which indirectly connected the community with people who were associated with Downside, such as um, past um, school pupils who were, who were able to donate funds. Um, the society was designed for the less nebulous purpose of keeping the connection between those away from the monastery and in touch with events that were happening, and was also um, as such responsible for the proposal for the Downside Review which was first made by Mr. Alfred Ma uh, Maskell, who remains a close friend of the community. And then you, this outreach using the Downside Review also enabled the community to form um, people that were associated with Downside of the building's progress. Um, 
And so this sort of generated income and um, enabled the monks just to keep building um, as um, awareness of what they were doing spread throughout um, the sort of old Gregorians and um, people that have been associated with downside and people that were interested in what was going on. Um, and so money did start flooding in, um, for example, um, from um, a quote from um, Butler, I think, while he, Gasquet, was prior of the great church, a downside was still a dream unenvisioned by the community. One mo morning, he received a large check for the Lady Chapel. After breakfast, he felt inspired and rushing out, trod the present noble proportions, leaving pegs where the nave should reach and eventually did. And presumably the same manner of thought, Gasquet um, was also incredibly generous himself. Um, he donated the Madonna and Child, um, which uh, you can see in the Abbey Church, which is evocative in the dark wood, which dated from the 1460s and adds emphasis to the historic importance of the Abbey Church. And it adds precedence to the community's desire for a church that would evoke a medieval atmosphere, something that is often referred to by the community. Um, here in a letter to Edmund Bishop, um, which was a close friend of his and fellow scholar, Gasquet references the ambition of the community to present the Abbey Church as a continuation of the supposed medieval past. He said, the church is making great progress and in a couple of weeks we should have the whole grand plan worked out in stone. The more I see it rise, the more impatient I get to see the choir. It would certainly be like, like one of the old churches of any in England. And so this emphasis on the creation of the church as a medieval relic shows that for the community construction was much about providing a creative of continuality and precedence as a new and established home for the community. However, the Abbey is still a repository for several important relics, such as um, fragments of the True Cross that perhaps belong to Westminster and St. Thomas of Hereford, which also link medi um, downside to the uh, medieval church. From the first plans and subsequent enlargement, Gasquet's memoirs highlight this ambition. And he began to dream, dreams of a bigger school, bigger monastery, bigger community, and at last of a towering minster like the great English abbeys of old. And so this clear sense of ambition and the divide between expectations and reality seems to have always been a really prevalent attitude to the building work. And I think can be seen in the way that, you know, you have the finished, uh, unfinished end and this idea that, and the fact that it's such a grand um, abbey in the middle of the Somerset countryside. And so just a few words to conclude. The present suggests a word about the past, which is a quotation from a line in Gasquet's speech on the opening about the choir. This typifies the attitude of the community, more specifically the movement and Ford and Gasquet on the relationship between themselves and the past. The whole speech of Gasquet's is highly reflective on matters of the past, having sought to connect his recent elevation to cardinal and the manifestation of the church to historic precedents. This demonstrates how the community and Gasquet and Ford and the other members of the movement saw the past as really important. It also demonstrates how the progression of the monastery impacted their developing monastic careers and shows how the development of this complete monastic vision and reform was influenced by the ambitious building plans that Ford and Gasquet developed. This collaborative effort in shaping their monastic futures continued throughout their lives and helped shape their approach to their own monastic identities as well as the building itself. In developing the reform movement, the young monastic community led by Sford sought to match the grandeur of the rising stonework and develop the monastic community beyond its walls. The relationship between foundational histories and the construction of the Abbey Church was clearly influenced by members of the community, and as such, Ford and Gasquet were prominent figures both in the controversy and the construction of the Abbey Church. It is their shared vision that is represented throughout the building. This shared vision is similarly reflected in the community's connection to the medieval and a desire to recreate the medieval past and the architecture and the symbolism of the Abbey Church. And this confidence was reflected in the building work that took place at Downside, wherein the building acted as a tribute to the confidence the community possessed. In the words of Gasquet, writing for the Centenary Review of the Downside, of the Centenary issue of the Downside Review, the monks found themselves dwelling in a monastery and erecting a church, which as far as material buildings went, placed Downside in the ranks of the greater Benedictine monasteries of the world. And this really suggests that the community continued to be aware of the historical significance of building Abbey. This awareness has followed the building since its inception and demonstrates the community's emphasis on foundational history that continues to dominate even after the end of the controversy. It, prevents the ab it presents the Abbey as a symbol of the religious principles that were reaffirmed during the controversy 
and asserts the presence of the community in this location. The fall in Gasquet, the culmination of a lifetime's work, resulted in the Abbey Church that still stands today. Thank you. Do feel